Hello, my friends. Today we have Dr. Jody Peacock on the show. She is a naturopathic doctor, an author, and a public educator. She is the author of Preconceived, a book designed to help support patients through the journey of fertility and conception. She is also the founder of the F Canadian Fertility Show, which we'll be talking about in this episode as well. So without further ado, welcome, Jody. How are you today? Great. Thank you so much for having me today, Nora. I really appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for being here. I love interviewing practitioners like yourself, and I'm really excited to dive into today's topic. So today we're going to talk to, we're going to talk about the importance of lab testing during the preconception period, helping women um, learn a little bit more about their health, about themselves, what certain tests mean, why they need to get them, which tests should be done. But before we get there, I always love to get into a little bit of a personal story with my guests. So can you share with us just a little bit about your background, who you are, and why you came into the fertility space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up as a fairly competitive athlete. Um, and when I hit um, naturopathic school, obviously, at that point, like I wasn't training at the same level that I had before and started to have a lot of changes with my cycle. And so actually ended up getting diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And I distinctly remember the doctor at the time who kind of gave me the diagnosis was like, it's going to be really hard for you to get pregnant. Uh, you know, like you shouldn't wait. It's going to be an issue, right? And at this point, I'm second year of my medical program. I'm in a relationship, but not really in a place where I'm like, oh, I'm ready to like have kids. And so I think I kind of took that in and was like, okay, well, what can I do to really kind of help protect and preserve my fertility with this diagnosis? And then how can I help other people with it? So that kind of got me in this kind of realm to start out with. Um, and then, you know, through my years of clinical practice, just seeing more and more, you know, athletes that were kind of diagnosed with PCOS, and then also just women struggling with their hormonal health in general, um, kind of led me more on this path towards fertility and just seeing the lack of kind of good education and knowledge that was, you know, given to, to patients. So that's kind of where then I started on the path of, okay, let's start this show and give people more resources so they know that it's not just this like one fertility clinic that they've been referred yes. to and that's the only place they can get information from right so. absolutely I love that love it exactly I came to your fertility the Canadian fertility show a few years ago this was before COVID when I started to decide that I was going to niche into this fertility space as well and I remember just it, it's awesome because we live in the same city well in the same province um and it's so nice to it was I loved loved coming to the show there was so much cool information there uh, at the time I was thinking about doing single mom by choice. And I remember I was going around to all the different booths and looking at sperm banks and learning all about that. So um, yeah, we'll definitely talk about the Canadian fertility show uh, in, in a little bit, but first um, I, I want to, I want to, I'd love for you to share with the audience or the listeners, I should say um, some of the lab tests that are necessary during the preconception phase um, of, of the journey. And so why don't we start first maybe with um, the nutrients. So can you share what some of the top nutrients uh, women should test for um, in, in the preconception stage? So I'm a big fan of like, obviously as a naturopathic doctor, we work more in a little bit more preventative medicine, right? So yes. rather than kind of waiting till there's a problem and trying to intervene, I prefer to try and get ahead of it, right? So mm -hmm. if I have a patient that comes in, they're like, you know what, I'm thinking about getting pregnant. So they could be just in that very early phase, or they may be, I've had three failed IVFs, right? Like it could be anywhere on this spectrum. The spectrum like, yeah. So let's look at if we don't have our basic nutrients covered off, it's going to be very hard to get pregnant. And we know this based on the research. So looking at things like your vitamin D level, um, most clinics don't even run that as a standard, even before they do an IVF transfer. And we know if your vitamin D is low, your chance of conception is lower and your chance of having a pregnancy loss is higher. So let's get that vitamin D level checked. Um, on your lab work, it's a, it's a lab work called 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And ideally we want to see this number over hundred. 
So this is another place where naturopathic doctors may interpret your lab work a little bit differently than um, your family doctor or your nurse practitioner might. Um, Because again, they're typically trained to look at you know, what is going to kill you? If it's not going to kill you, then we're probably good. We're, again, we're looking more at how we can optimize your function, right? So with that reference range, 75 is typically the cutoff. But again, we like to see it in that over 100. Now with vitamin D, it is a fat soluble vitamin. So what that means is it does concentrate in the body. So there is the chance of getting a toxicity or, or too high of a level. And so this again is where I think running that lab work is so important because, you know, the general kind of recommendation from the World Health Organization is 2000 IUs of vitamin D per day for an adult. And, you know, I'll have some patients that they're taking that amount and we run their vitamin D and it's at 40, like it's so low, it's like not even registering. And then other patients get that 2000, they're out of 120, they're good, right? So that lab work is really important to help you figure out what dose um, you actually need for your vitamin D. Then we also need to look at some of the nutrients that are really important in blood building. So things like your iron level. Again, we know if you're iron deficient, it's also harder to get pregnant. So there's a a marker called ferritin that looks at the storage of your iron. Um, This marker, since I've been in practice now, I guess 17 years, it's been quite a while. Um, it, the reference range has actually changed since when I first started to now. So it keeps dropping. So this is another marker that I find often, you know, maybe gets run, but then, you know, a patient may be sitting at a 10 and nobody talks to them about it. Um, where, you know, with iron or with that ferritin, we ideally would like to see it over 50. Um, so if you're, you know, waking up in the morning, it's really hard for you to get out of bed. You've seen changes with hair, you, you know, you actually, you know, are pale, you're tired. Those are some of the signs or symptoms that you might be iron deficient. Um, And so getting that level checked is important. But also, you know, I find a lot of women just carry on, right? They're like, we run their blood work. And you're like, Oh, like, how are you even getting out of bed? Your fear turns out of five, like, like, yes, and it becomes a norm, right? So this is where I think running the blood work is important so that we can kind of match, okay, these are the symptoms that you're having with, okay, this is what your blood is actually showing us. Um, Also B vitamins like your folate or your folic acid levels, um, your uh, B12 also, those two are very important for a pathway called methylation, which is very relevant in, in in a process called DNA replication. So when your egg, um, you know, meets sperm and everything starts dividing rapidly. If we don't have enough B12 and folate, that process can can have basically blips in it, which can then either again wind up in you having um, you know a pregnancy loss. It may be something that you didn't even you know you weren't even aware that happened because it happened so early in the process, or it could be a little bit further along um, in the process. So those four, I would say, are probably the most core key nutrients that from a testing standpoint, you want to just get a baseline and make sure they're in a good range before you even think about going into a pregnancy. Um, And those are also relevant from the male side. Like I know you mentioned our female patients. Um, Those are all really important for sperm health as well. So I actually recommend, you know, a preconception screening for both sides, right? Man and depending on if you're doing a sperm donor, that obviously is a little bit more challenging, but if you are, you know, in a, you know, more traditional heterosexual relationship and there is a male partner, um, you know, getting both tested is really important. Mm-hmm. And so a couple questions about, you were mentioning some signs and symptoms that people could, might even notice just without even getting your blood levels checked, that these might be low from the lethargy, the fatigue, the, you know, the pale skin, potentially even dark circles under their eyes. Um, what are your thoughts on also being, because as a holistic nutritionist myself, um, I see this a lot, especially with clients who are more vegan or vegetarian and don't necessarily eat the animal based protein. Um, you know, it's, everybody's got their reasons for wanting to eat certain way. And it's really important that we respect that. But especially when, um, I work with vegan or vegetarians, I always say like, being a responsible vegan and vegetarian with regards to knowing, you know, how to supplement the body because you aren't, you know, a lot of these nutrients are more concentrated in the animal 
source proteins and are more bioavailable to the body, which might not be as bioavailable or prevalent um, in the plant-based protein. So would you say that would be, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, especially these are the nutrients uh, to get checked? Well, and absolutely. So, I mean, outside of like anything to do with conception, like yes. we know vegan people don't get B12, typically their iron can be on the lower side. So yeah, those are things that we want to be checking like, at, you know, with that diet choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And I do have your book. I have the preconceived book. I love it. It's my little, sometimes I'm like, I need a little answer to questions and I flip through your book, but um, I know you talk about um, the MTHFR gene. So since we were quickly talking about folate, can you share with, um, with the listeners um, the, well, why don't we start with um, the difference between folic acid and folate and how you, you might have an issue metabolizing it based on the MTHFR gene. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So kind of going back to that comment where I made about that methylation pathway, that pathway is basically an eight step process. And one step in that process involves a gene called your MTHFR gene. So this gene basically codes for your ability to convert a synthetic folic acid or your regular folate um, into its active form, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So that's a bit of a mouthful. So we call it 5-MTHFR for short. <laughs> About 15% of the population has basically a copy of this gene where they don't metabolize folic acid properly. So for those patients, if they're, you know, the majority of their um, folate is coming through synthetic folic acid, it'll actually jam that meth methylation pathway. And so then that will have, could have an impact on, again, you know, basically the quality of embryo as it develops, because it's important for that replication piece, but it also will play a role in all the other metabolic processes in your body, right? So outside right. of pregnancy, we ha we see it impact things like mood, anxiety, um, we'll see it have an impact on general energy production as well. Um, so, you know, there definitely is a subset of the population that doesn't do well with synthetic folic acid. So this will play a role when you're choosing, you know, what prenatal you might want to take. So some prenatals will actually have the active form of folate, that 5-MTHFR form in it so that if you don't know your genetic status, you just take that end kind of product of the folate and you know it's going to help that pathway. Um, this is also a reason where I think a lot of patients do well on a grain-free diet. Yes. Um, so some people you know, do react to gluten, but for other people, like most of our grains are fortified with synthetic folic acid. Yes. And so if you're eating a diet with a lot of grains in it that are fortified and you have this genetic SNP, um, again, it will jam that pathway on you. So Sometimes when we hear stories, you know, of patients like, you know, I wasn't getting pregnant and then I took, you know, gluten out or I took gluten grains out and then I got pregnant. Part of me wonders, was it the gluten or was it the, the right. folic acids, right? Because both of those can play a role for those patients. And it is possible. So you can get testing for um, the genetic mutation is that, but I know a lot of um, sometimes you really got to twist the doctor's arm in order to get that because not everybody wants to give it to you, but is, yeah. Somebody... I mean, there are some companies that um, as a patient, you can go to directly to get that testing done. Um, as a naturopath in Ontario, we can't recommend genetic testing. So you can't get it through your naturopathic doctor. Um, but definitely there are companies like 23andMe, um, yeah, like there's um, Fern DNA actually has uh, they're a newer platform, but yeah, we had Dr. Dr. Tracy DNA. on the show. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So their platform like looks specifically at, you know, genes relevant to fertility. So that's also another great one that you can look at as a patient. Okay. Awesome. I'll make sure to link those in the show notes. Um, let's talk about uh, like just uh, CBC, like our, our blood count. Is there anything to worry about in a basic CBC? So I think one of the kind of bigger things that you're looking for there is something called your hemoglobin. Um, so your hemoglobin um, in your CBC is basically 
codes for your ability to carry oxygen to your cells that can be linked either to low, you know, if it's not um, in a good range, it can be linked to low iron. Um, it can be linked to B12 or folate as well. So, and typically, you know, if it is due to an iron deficiency or nutrient deficiency, we'll actually see, you know, like something like the ferritin will deplete essentially down to zero before we see changes in hemoglobin. So if we're actually seeing a low hemoglobin level, like we're kind of next stage of iron deficiency and you're probably not feeling great from an energy standpoint if we're seeing that. Because in pregnancy, your blood volume needs to double, you really want to make sure your hemoglobin is in a good range before you go into a pregnancy, because otherwise you're going to feel absolutely gassed the entire time, right? And mm -hmm. you may not even be able to get pregnant, right? In some situations, you, you know, because your hemoglobin is so low, that can then have an impact on your ability to ovulate um, or to also maintain a pregnancy. So that's a big one. And then we also want to look at your white blood cell counts um, and just make sure, you know, you're not dealing with any kind of infection. Um, your white blood cell counts, if you're dealing with kind of anything acute, will go up. Um, so if you're seeing those kind of in a high range, you certainly want to address whatever that underlying infection piece is before going into a pregnancy. Okay, great. These are all great, great tips, great things to think about. And so outside the nutrient and um, the blood count uh, and the white blood cells, can we talk a little bit about the hormone levels? Because I think this is, well, I think nutrients and hormones, a lot of people are, are aware of these things, but I love these, these extra um, tips and pieces you're giving. This is, uh, this is great. So um, what, what are the kind of top main hormones that maybe women should start thinking about testing or just getting as a, a general, a general panel for fertility? So typically, I mean, your main hormones, estrogen, progesterone, um, testosterone, DHEA are probably your four kind of most prominent um, ones when we're looking at fertility with your estrogen, testosterone, DH, well, estrogen typically you want to run on day three of your menstrual cycle because estrogen is a like estrogen basically is known as our kind of our growing hormone right so it's going to increase at the beginning of the cycle that's part of the piece that's going to help stimulate um, your eggs to actually start to develop um, through the cycle so that we want to test fairly early in the cycle we also look at two other hormones that day follicle stimulating hormone or fsh and luteinizing hormone or lh so these two hormones are ones that come from the pituitary and kind of signal downstream. So follicle stimulating hormone, obviously is named because it helps stimulate follicle growth. Mm -hmm. um, if your FSH gets too high, that usually will be a red flag to your fertility clinic to say, okay, what's going on here? Like we need it in a good range, but not too elevated. Um, and then LH or luteinizing hormone is the hormone that ends up kind of triggering ovulation for you. So sometimes your doctors will talk about giving you like a trigger shot or, you know, a treatment to kind of speak. So that's a part of what happens there. And, and the FSH and LH should be in kind of an appropriate ratio to one another. So if one's really high and one's really low, that might be more of a flag than if they're both kind of slightly elevated, right? Because if they're staying in that ratio, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, then we look at our testosterone. So testosterone comes in kind of two different ways. Like one is free testosterone. So that's kind of what's kind of circulating in the bloodstream. And then you also have bound testosterone. So there's two different blood levels you can look at for that. Um, and here again, like we need kind of, we need enough testosterone um, for things to function, but we don't want it to be too elevated. And typically where you will see it elevated is in the PCOS population like that's one of the flags that will come back to say okay this this you know female patient may be struggling with um with pcos if we're seeing that elevated um and then dhea is kind of your precursor to um your testosterone so that's another one that sometimes like your testosterone might look normal but your dhea is high or you know it could be low so running both of them gives you a much better picture as to what's going on um, and then with your progesterone, during the first half of your cycle, your progesterone should be quite low. So for anyone listening who maybe has been to a fertility clinic and they've done kind of their cycle monitoring, 
when you go in on kind of day two or day three, day five, day seven, like there, we want your progesterone low. After you ovulate though, that's when your progesterone becomes our big player and estrogen now isn't kind of as relevant. So estrogen will kind of drop as your progesterone goes up. And progesterone is really important for maintaining um, your lining. So if your progesterone is not rising during the second half of your cycle, um, that can make it really difficult for you to maintain a pregnancy because basically you don't maintain your lining, you get an early period. And even if there was an embryo there, it gets flushed out. So that progesterone piece, typically we want to run it if you have a regular menstrual cycle. So that's a big if for a lot of patients, depending on what's going on for them. We'd like to run it seven days before your expected period or seven days after you ovulate. So you can kind of time it up with either of those two. And that, that second half or that luteal phase should be around 14 days for women, at least 10, um, kind of at a minimum for, you know, you to be able to have a healthy conception typically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just actually, so recording a couple of podcasts today, but I just got off of a podcast, um, that I just recorded, um, from somebody who is, has a, to, it's the proof test, the technology for women to do ovulation test kits. And she said something about running a, um, they ran a test for women who were trying to conceive and just, we were talking about progesterone and how many women in this population, it is so low. They said they ran a research, uh, they ran, um, they ran a research lab and they ended up, um, 58% of women who were trying to conceive had low progesterone, 58 so it's just, I mean, I see this a lot of the time in my practice as well, just being a woman, a woman, especially throughout my thirties, I really notice it in my thirties more than I did maybe in my twenties, but with my friends and progesterone is, is, and I, I kind of call it the progesterone is the pregnancy hormone PP. It's easy to remember, um, but is such a big influencer. And I think a lot of the times is a big missing, missing piece for, um, for a lot of women who might be struggling or even just getting these checked up front so that you know in advance before you even start trying that this is maybe something that you've got to focus on so that you don't run into problems when you get there. Well, and I think one of the things, that, again, like trying to be proactive, checking it beforehand, because if it is low, you know, it's easy to prescribe progesterone you know, at the second half of your cycle, and then you just, you know, you keep it going, you do a pregnancy test, if you're pregnant, you keep it in. If you're mm -hmm. not, then you stop it. And, and you'll have your, you know, withdrawal bleed. But I mean, it's something that you like, I never want a patient to have a pregnancy loss because of low progesterone. If mm -hmm. we like, if, if we know about it, we need to address it, right. And, yes. and it is so common that, you know, I, I think it's in our best interest to be proactive and check it ahead of time mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like rather than you know the the typical like wait till you have three pregnancy losses and then we'll yes. explore things no why do we have to make someone suffer through three pregnancy losses when we know you know there are five mthfr is a common reason low progesterone is a common like we, yes. these are things we can check really easily for women right yeah so why wouldn't we check them and get it? And then, you know, if those aren't there and we're seeing pregnancy losses, then yes, then we investigate obviously further. further to figure out what mm. else is there. But those are such common reasons that, again, I think we, we can be proactive about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then also just being mindful um, of understanding and knowing when to test it as well, right? Like seven days after ovulation or I guess like seven days before the bleed. So you can confirm when you ovulate, as long as you know that you've ovulated, count seven days and then check the progesterone then as opposed to quote unquote day 21. Uh, and I harp on that all the time. So whoever's listening, if this is not their fir first episode in this podcast, they will know that information already. <laughs> um, and then also on the other side, not to panic if you run your progesterone before you ovulate, because yes. then it should be low. Yes. Right. Like absolutely. It, it should be low before you ovulate. So that is also normal. So I just yes. like, cause sometimes they pack it on when they're running other hormones and it's not Needs really to be kind of applicable. Think, so yes, totally. So what about the thyroid hormone? So thyroid is a finicky hormone that can be complicated because there are so many different thyroid hormones to test. A lot of 
doctors don't necessarily test anything past CSH. And so can, why don't you share, let's talk about the thyroid infertility and then maybe share some of the tests that you think are necessary. Yeah, absolutely. So with thyroid, kind of the screening test that will get run is TSH. So that's your thyroid stimulating hormone. So again, that's a hormone that comes from the pituitary to tell the thyroid to make T4 or thyroxin. Um, with TSH, there is what's called a positive feedback loop. So basically TSH tells your thyroid to make T4. T4 goes out into circulation. It gets converted in the tissues into T3. When T3 reaches kind of a high enough level, it feedbacks to the pituitary to say we're good. We don't need like, so basically slow down your production of TSH. That's how that loop works. So typically as a screening, just TSH will get run. If TSH looks like it's fine, then we kind of say, okay, we're good and, and move along. Now with that TSH, the reference range here, I think becomes very relevant or important. So with most, like each lab has a slightly different range, but typically the range will go from kind of one to four and a half. Um, when we look at the data around um, conception and pregnancy, we ideally want to see the TSH under two and a half. So why we have four and a half as the high end of the range, because if it's the better thing for pregnancy, it's probably also better for other <laughs> reasons as well. So I'm not sure why we don't just lower that cutoff range. So that would be the first thing to look at, because sometimes, you know, we'll see someone come back, they're 3.5, they're four. So they're in the range. It hasn't been flagged but we know it's not optimal for pregnancy. So if we are seeing it kind of in that higher range, and if there's any symptoms that make me think there potentially is a thyroid piece, we want to move on to also run what's called your free T3 and your free T4 to actually look at those two thyroid hormones to see, are they actually in a good range? And, and typically with the reference ranges for those ones, we wanted to see them at least kind of mid, uh, mid range when they come back. Then there's also the piece where a lot of women that have been struggling to conceive or have had pregnancy losses, we also see it in much higher amounts in our PCOS population have actually an autoimmune condition that's affecting their thyroid called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so with Hashimoto's, there's two antibodies that we actually want to look at through blood work. So one is called um, anti-thyroglobulin or anti-TG, and the other one is called anti-TPO. And so with these two, if we see that they come back elevated, and the thing that's interesting with this is those can come back elevated, even when your TSH, T3 and T4 look totally normal. Mm -hmm. So this is where, again, if I've got an unexplained infertility, like I don't necessarily run thyroid antibodies just on every single person for no reason. But if we've got an unexplained infertility case, if I have a patient that has PCOS, I will always run it because this is what happened to me. Like, mm -hmm. when I ran mine, my TSH has never been over 2.5. Like it always looks good. My T4 and T3 are good. But then, you know, my anti TPO was at 700. It's like, okay, wow. that's not great. Yeah, so it is something that I think we take that extra step to look at in, you know, certain cases. Again, it doesn't have to like, Vitamin D, that's getting run on everybody. Iron, that's getting run on everybody. Yes. Thyroid antibodies aren't necessarily like, okay, we have to do this on every person, but certainly, you know, in certain situations, yes, I think it's important to run all five of those, you know, pieces so that we really know what's happening with the thyroid. Um, typically through the traditional medical system, they won't run the antibodies because the treatment is the same regardless. So if somebody has, you know, an elevated TSH, they're going to get prescribed um, a drug called thyroxine or the kind of label term is Synthroid. You, you know, a lot of people would have heard of that name. Um, and with using those medications, typically, eventually we will see the antibody levels come down. But from a naturopathic standpoint, I think it's really important to know, do you just have hypothyroid or is it autoimmune hypothyroid? So if you're seeing that elevated TSH, but you have no antibody levels, we're not dealing with an autoimmune thing, right? Where if we're seeing the antibody levels, that autoimmune piece is in play. And, you know, from a naturopathic perspective, we know, you know, when you get diagnosed with one autoimmune condition, if we don't do anything to help change how your immune system is reacting and responding, typically eight to 10 years later, we'll show up with another autoimmune condition. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, as a naturopath, me doing my due diligence for a patient, I think that's really important because if I can talk to you and we can make changes to prevent you from getting, you know, showing up in my office 10 years from now with rheumatoid, with lupus, with Crohn's, with colitis, like with one of these other autoimmune conditions, I think that's in your best interest as a patient, right? So um, that's where I think it's really important to look at. And because we, you know, pregnancy is often a time when we will see autoimmune conditions show up with women. So, you know, getting ahead of it again, checking it, seeing, is this an issue as part of this? And, and, you know, sometimes a patient may have been on Synthroid for five, 10 years and their antibodies are still up where other patients, they are low, right? So again, I think it's an individual case by case thing that we need to look at. And so curious um, from your your perspective, if somebody is on, I know a lot of times people are prescribed Synthroid because of one time their TSH was elevated and that's what their doctor said to do. So they did it. Now they've been on it for five, 10 years. And then they're like, well, I was just told to take this. So is is there a way that people can also get off of their thyroid meds and then still be able to have a healthy thyroid after being on them for years? I mean, it, de- it-, it often will depend how long they've been on them for because because you're kind of replacing what the thyroid should have been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for some patients, yes, can their thyroid function recover? For others, no, it doesn't. So they end up needing medication long term. So I think part of it depends on, you know, what the cause was in the first place and if there is anything mm-hmm. that we can can change. But if they've been on it 10, 15 years, the chance of coming off, I would say are pretty low. Pretty low. Right. Okay. Um, and then one last thing about the thyroid, and then we'll, we'll jump on to the next was, um, I know uh, there's a lot of uh, the women in my community were trying to get pregnant, and then they get pregnant, which is the ultimate goal and a wonderful thing. And then um, when you are pregnant, I know, so the thyroid, um, your thyroid gland, essentially is responsible for the embryos thyroid, I, what is it for the first nine, almost the first trimester, I think, and then eventually, after the first trimester, the baby's thyroid is able to take over and then do its own thing. So um, a lot of my clients get their thyroid tested in the first trimester when they just do some general screening. But can you maybe talk about, because um, but I know those numbers jump up. They I see those numbers jump up quite a bit in that first trimester. Is this something to be overly concerned about? Or um, can you just maybe speak to how maybe the thyroid changes in the first trimester during pregnancy? Yeah, so definitely it is something if somebody has a thyroid concern going into the pregnancy, we want to monitor it very carefully because if it gets too elevated, it can be a reason for pregnancy loss. So Mm -hmm. it is something that they should be, um, typically you would get, like a patient would get referred to an endocrinologist, um, so a doctor that specializes in hormone that um, also, you know, is in the know with pregnancy so that they Mm -hmm. can monitor that for them. Um, I will typically, if they, you know, if they fall through the cracks and they don't have somebody yet, or they're waiting for the referral, um, I will typically give, uh, you know, a requisition to run it to like every two weeks through that first trimester to make sure that we're not seeing it go up. Now, for patients that have no previous history of any thyroid concerns, yes, we will typically see, you know, TSH go up a little bit in that first, tri- but we should see it still be kind of in that normal range. Like it shouldn't be skyrocketing to an 810. Like that is not something we should be seeing. And if we are, then that's where that should trigger that referral, um, you know, into a specialist. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And you don't want to be around with it. Like, Right. Especially it's just such a um, finicky time in that first trimester. So many new things, yeah. so many things are happening in such a short period of time. So, you know, that's, that's helpful. Um, and so what about um, autoimmune disorders? So I kind of guess we talked about the autoimmunity a little bit when we were talking about um, the thyroid, but any other general, I guess, panels to screen with regards to autoimmune disorders uh, for somebody I don't know, to flag, to think about uh, in the preconception preconception stage? I think more so where kind of that comes into play, somebody that has like a pre-existing 
autoimmune condition, we want to make sure they're as stable as possible before going into a pregnancy, right? So mm -hmm. if you've got rheumatoid arthritis, if you have a colitis, Crohn's, like any of those um, autoimmune conditions, we want to be checking those antibody levels, seeing, you know, how well your body and your immune system is functioning before going into the pregnancy. So if there are diet changes, if there are nutrients that we're missing that can help some of that, now it doesn't mean you're going to cure your autoimmune disease to be able to get pregnant. Like lots of patients obviously get pregnant with autoimmune conditions. Yes. Um, but, you know, getting your immune system in kind of as healthy a place as we can before going into the pregnancy is just going to make the pregnancy a lot easier for mm -hmm. you and more stable for growing baby, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. This is great. So we've got the nutrients, we've got the, com uh, the complete blood cell count. We looked at white blood cells. We looked at different hormone levels, the thyroid levels. And if you have autoimmune condition, definitely make sure you're on top of that before you start to try and get pregnant. Um, in addition to that, Jody, I know that uh, you, the Canadian Fertility Show is coming up. So I would love for you to share um, with our listeners about that. So obviously it's the Canadian Fertility Show. Yes, it is in Canada, but um, tell us about the Canadian Fertility Show and is it available also on, I was gonna say, yeah, online really, or? So it is gonna be in person, uh, back in person. This year's the last two years we did run it virtually um, before that it had been in person. We are going to go back to the in-person format, um, but leading up to the show, we will be doing lots of interviews with different speakers, sponsors, um, so that for people that aren't able to attend live, they will still be able to get access, you know, to information um, from those people. If you go to the website, um, we, you know, we're getting it populated now with uh, with the different speakers that are coming, um, with exhibitors, with um, different sponsors. So you can also always kind of reach out to people through there to see, you know, what they're doing, how to connect um, with them as well. Because it, the whole idea behind the show is, you know, really to provide resources for people all in one place, right? So you can come, you can talk to fertility doctors, you can talk to acupuncturists, you can talk to holistic nutritionists, you can talk to, uh, you know, psychotherapists, like all these different areas that may impact your fertility journey, you kind of get access to those experts all in one place. You don't have to take, you know, 10 days off work to go see four different clinics and visit, mm -hmm. you know, your different acupuncture, like you can actually kind of get a really good sense of, you know, is this person going to be a good fit for me? Is this a clinic that I want to work with? Um, and, you know, sometimes it also is eye opening to, to look at things that, you know, if you've been referred maybe to a fertility clinic, and you haven't really thought about any of these other aspects, like, oh, I didn't actually think about do I need to optimize my sperm health before I go into an IVF? cycle. Well, yeah, that's probably something you should talk to someone about, right? So mm -hmm. having kind of access to those experts and, and we typically will have about 20 lectures that go on during the day that cover a whole range of different topics. So again, people really get an opportunity to get some really good quality education um, that, you know, they may not be able to get outside of the show, right? In a kind of condensed way. Um, I also really love having it in person because of that sense of community, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of people going through fertility struggles or thinking about, you know, being a single parent by choice. Like there's so many different aspects that, you know, you go through and you're like, wow, there's actually a lot of other people in this same position, right? Because there's yes. still the stigma around fertility. A lot of, you know, a lot of patients don't even talk to their families about it. The fact that they're seeing a fertility doctor, I mean, the, the conversation is finally starting to change, but for a mm -hmm. lot of people, it is something that they, you know, really feel isolated and like they don't have anybody to talk to it about, right? So being able to kind of have that community feel a safe space where, you know, all these other people are also, you know, maybe not in the same position of what's happening for you, but, you know, also are thinking about family planning and how that might look for them and could be very similar to yours or it could be very different, right? So egg donation, embryo um, adoption, you know, traditional adoption, like these are all different ways that we can, can grow a family. And so you'll have kind of options to explore those there as well. Amazing. And when is it? Can you tell us when it is? 
Yeah, so it's uh, Saturday, May 13th, uh, and it's going to be held at the International Centre near uh, Toronto Pearson Airport. And is it one one full day or two days? One is day. it a weekend? Yeah. One day. Yeah, just one day. Yeah, just a okay. Saturday. Yeah. Great. And we'll make sure to, um, I'm just going to cut it here for a second. So you said, uh, um, is there like, is there like a, a discount code I can provide listeners yeah, or I'll, something? Yeah, I'll create a, a discount code for you that you can promote to your um, followers for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so we can make it like whatever you want to call it. I don't know if you want to call it. Yeah. We, we can, can do make a PPC, it. like something easy. Yeah. Or it's going to say like, usually I do like NN, like naturally Nora. Um, I don't know. Okay. We'll figure, we'll figure actually, let me just say, maybe we'll, um, cause I want to, I want to, you know what, I'll, I'll edit it. I'll do it after I'll just, I'll edit it and cut it in after when we decide what it is. Um, We'll figure okay. it out in a second. Yeah, I mean, I can make it whatever you want. So if you want NN50 and that'll give people 50% sure. off. Sure, let's there. do that. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. NN50, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to jump back in and say. Um, and yeah. also, also um, for those who want to attend and are in the greater Toronto area, um, Jody, you have so graciously given our listeners 50% off. So if you use code NN50 um, in the checkout, I guess there'll be like a coupon code space. Uh, they'll be able to get the discount. So we'll make sure that that is listed in the show notes for everybody below. Um, Jody, if there is, I always ask my guests at the end of the podcast, what um, what is one piece of advice you would give anybody who is on their trying to conceive journey or thinking about um, thinking about preparing for pregnancy? If, it, if you just had one piece of advice to give somebody, what would it be? Listen to your gut. If something doesn't feel right, if you're in a place, if you don't agree with something, if it doesn't seem like it's right, listen to that, get another opinion. Because there's been, I've seen so many patients that, you know, have maybe stayed somewhere a little bit too long that have undergone a procedure that they maybe didn't actually need, you know, things like that. Like if it doesn't feel right, you don't need to rush into anything. I mean, unless there's obviously like an emergency situation where something is burst, you don't maybe have, but like most of the things to do with fertility are not emergency situations. So if it doesn't feel right, get another opinion because um, you'll probably get a different answer. Mm -hmm. Love it. So many people have said that and I say that too. So I, I love that it just keeps being repeated and reinforced with every, with every, with every episode. So thank you. Thank you, Jody, so much for your time, for your knowledge and um, for all of the guidance that you've given our listeners today. Um, I'm really excited to see you at the Canadian Fertility Show because I will absolutely be there. Uh, and once again, I'll make sure all of those links um, that we talked about in the show are listed in the show notes below. Uh, and we'll see you Hopefully, maybe I'll have you back on and we'll talk about something else with regards to fertility. <laughs> thank you, Jody. Thank you, so, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So thank you for your time and thank you for those of you guys who have listened today. Thank you.